Hey, uh, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 13. Just got back from Chicago a couple of days ago. We spoke to some pastors there in preparation for our upcoming crusade that we have dates for now. And those dates are September 24 to 26. So we're excited about bringing the gospel to that part of our country. And uh, thank you for those of you uh, that were praying for us on this trip. Uh, Mark 13, the title of my message is Signs of the Times. And this is a part of a series within a series that we are doing. The series is called Essentials. And this series within it is on the theme of the last days. And that's what we want to talk about together. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning and I go out for the day, I want to know what the weather will be like. This is especially true when I'm going on a trip. I was just in Chicago. It was very cold, so I took this long coat to wear. And when I got off the plane coming back to California, I went to weather that was in the 40s, arriving in weather that was somewhere in the 90s, you know. So a little bit of a weather change there. So you like to check it out. But here's what I've discovered. I don't know if most weathermen even know what they're talking about. Because they'll say there is no rain and then it rains or they say it's going to rain and it doesn't rain. The one sure way I have found to get it to rain is just wash my car. It's as simple as that. But as I've told you before, I think I know ahead of the weatherman when rain is coming because bald men always know when it's raining first. It's true. My wife and I will be walking down the street and I'll say, it's raining. She'll say, it is not. And I say, oh no, it is. No, it's not. I said, it is. But her hair is so thick, she wouldn't know if it was raining for a day, you know. <laughs> say, no, I feel it, you know. So we can sort of look out the window and tell by the clouds and tell by the way things are looking what kind of day it's going to be. And the Bible tells us that there are signs of the times for us to look at. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 3, you're good at reading the weather signs in the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. And all around us there are signs of the times, if you will, and they're saying one thing, Jesus Christ is coming back again. Some are a little easier to read than others. You know, when you travel, especially around the world, you discover that something is often lost in translation. There will be things that other places that uh, are countries that will translate their phrases into English and it won't make sense. I remember I was in England years ago and all over the place I saw these big signs and windows that said, Bill Stickers will be prosecuted. And I began to wonder, what has this guy done? Because I saw these signs everywhere and I finally asked some a British person, who is Bill Stickers and what is he in trouble for? And they said, they looked at me like I was an idiot. And they said, what's wrong with you, mate? It, Bill Stickers is not a person. It's people that put up flyers on buildings. Oh, sorry. See, the idea is if you put up posters and things, you're a bill sticker. And then you will be prosecuted. Hence, bill stickers will be prosecuted. I thought it was a person who was going to be arrested if they ever caught him. <laughs> I remember when I was in Australia a while back, you go into a restaurant and you look at the menu and they have different names for different types of food. For instance, you read rocket with bugs. And I said to the server, what on earth is rocket with bugs. Oh, that salad with shrimp on it. What? They call salad rocket. Don't ask me why. And they call shrimp or lobster bugs. And I remember in that same restaurant I asked them uh, about a certain dish they had. It was a certain kind of fish. I said, describe this fish. He said, it's very good. It's sort of a gray flesh. I, I don't want it now. I just, I don't like gray flesh. Eating that, it kind of, you know. And then I thought of other things that I've heard about. This is a list of signs from around the world where something was translated into English that didn't quite make sense. For instance, in a Bucharest hotel lobby on the elevator, which they will call a lift, is a sign that says this. This lift is being fixed for the next day. During that time we regret that you will be unbearable. You know, they just sort of get it turned around a little bit. How about this? In a, in a Paris elevator it says, please leave your values at the front desk. Not your valuables, your values. In a Belgrade hotel elevator it says, to move the cabin 
push button for wishing floor. If the cabin should enter more persons, each one should press a number of wishing floor. Driving is then going automatically by national order. Okay. <laughs> In a Hong Kong super supermarket is this sign. For your convenience we recommend courageous, efficient self-service. I like that. Courageous self-service. Be courageous and get it yourself. In a hotel in Athens, visitor, there's a sign that says, Visitors are expected to complain at the office between 9 and 11 daily. <laughs> Not you're allowed to complain. No, we expect you to complain from 9 to 11 in particular. How about this one? On the menu of a Polish hotel. These are not jokes. These are actual things. Uh, the menu of a Polish hotel. Here's a description of a dish. Tell me if you would order this. Salad of firm zone mate. Limpid red beet soup with cheesy dumplings in the form of a finger. Roasted duck let loose beef rashers beaten up in the country people's fashion. Okay. In an advertisement for a Hong Kong dentist is this sign, teeth extracted by the latest Methodists. <laughs> Not the latest methods, the latest Methodists. I bet you didn't know they were doing that. In the window, <laughs> this one's kind of creepy. In the window of a Swedish furrier, fur coats made for ladies from their own skin. <laughs> wow. How about this detour sign in Japan? Stop. Drive sideways. Okay. I like this one. In a Copenhagen airline ticket office, we take your bags and send them in all directions. <laughs> yes, you do. And so do most airlines. Sometimes signs are hard to understand. Sometimes they're very easy to read. And I think there are many signs today, quite frankly, of the times that are very easy to read, telling us the Lord is coming back Again, look around your world today. We see things happening that the Bible hundreds of years ago predicted, like the regathering of the Jewish people into their homeland. I'll talk about that in a few moments, a little bit more. The isolation of Israel from the rest of the world and the increasing hostility towards them as we see nations like Iran threatening to, quote, wipe Israel off the face of the earth, end quote. Then we see the global turmoil ranging from the increase in earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis. We see the crash of the stock market, the change in the global economy, uh, the fading of the United States of America as the economic superpower and the emergence of new nations in our place. We see movement toward a one world currency. Are these signs of the times? Indeed they are. Things that Jesus said we should be looking for to alert us to the fact that His coming is near. Now as we look for the next few weeks together at the topic of end times events, eschatology as the theologians call it, I don't want it to be a mere academic exercise. I.e. I don't want you to just sort of absorb a bunch of facts because any proper study of the topic of prophecy should result in a changed heart. It should not only fill our mind, it should move our heart to want to walk more closely with the Lord. We read over in 1 John 3, Dear friends, you're God's children. We can't even imagine what we will be like when Christ returns. We know when He comes we'll be like Him. And see Him as He really is. And He that has this hope, what hope? The hope of the return of Jesus he that has this hope will keep himself pure even as Christ is pure. So as you understand the fact that Christ could come back at any moment, it should cause you to want to live a godly life, a pure life. Some people might say, oh, I can't figure out all this last day stuff. I'm not even going to try to sort it out. It's all so confusing. Well, that's a big mistake. Because a great deal of the Bible is dedicated to the subject of Bible prophecy and the return of Christ. 30% of Scripture is dedicated to the topic of the return of the Lord. And over in the book of Revelation there is a specific blessing promised to the one who hears and keeps the words of the prophecy. So if you want to be blessed, you want to know more about what the Lord says about His return. Tim LaHaye 
who has uh, been speaking on prophecy for many years, made this statement, and I quote, no scholar of academic substance denies that Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. And we find three times as many prophecies in the Bible relating to His second coming as to His first. Thus, the second advent of our Lord is three times as certain as His first coming, which can be verified as historical fact, end quote. It's true. We already know that the prophecy spoke of the arrival of Messiah for the first time, and yet there are three times as many passages that deal with Him coming again the second time. When the Bible describes the world before the return of Christ, we see a picture of a globe torn by strife and war, famine in the midst of plenty, rocked by earthquakes, ravaged by pestilence. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus said there'll be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth, dismay among, nation, dismay among nations and perplexity with no way out, men's hearts failing them for fear at the expectation of the things coming upon the world. Another translation puts it this way, it will seem like all hell has broken loose. Sun, moon, stars, earth, sea, in an uproar, and everyone around the world in a panic. The wind knocked out of them by the threat of doom. The powers that be quaking. Jesus told us that prior to his return, for instance, there would be an increase in earthquakes. Luke chapter 21, uh, verse 11 says, there'll be great earthquakes in various places and plagues and famines, and these will be signs from heaven. Now we've always had earthquakes and hurricanes and tsunamis and, and various climatic phenomena happen. But yet the Bible specifically goes on the record, if you will, to say there will be an increase in earthquakes prior to the return of Christ. You know, it's interesting that according to the U.S. Geological Society, uh, they say earthquakes are increasing. For the past five decades, every decade has seen an increase in the number of earthquakes. And they pointed out not just minor ones, but earthquakes that could be accurately described as killer quakes. For instance, in 2008, 69,000 people died in an earthquake in China. In 2005, 80,000 people died in an earthquake in Pakistan, but the one that most of us remember so clearly is the catastrophic tsunami of December 26, 2004 that was caused by the fourth most powerful undersea earthquake on record. An earthquake that was so powerful it moved the entire island of Sumatra 100 feet to the southwest from its pre-quake condition. And over 290,000 people lost their lives in that tragedy. There is an increase in these things and the Bible says to look at this. And Jesus described this as birth pangs. It says these are the beginning of birth pangs. In other words, the Bible is saying there will be an increase in the natural disasters that will increase in frequency and intensity with concert, in concert with each other before His return. There is a series of events that are going to happen that the Bible describes as the Great Tribulation period. There will be war, there will be pestilence, there will be earthquakes, there will be famine. And it could be likened to a group of dominoes tightly set up next to each other. And when that first domino falls, the others will follow in rapid succession. We're talking about a time that is coming upon the earth known as the tribulation. Let me just give you a quick bird's eye view of the big picture and then we're going to focus in on a few elements of this today and in our next studies we'll look more in depth at other things I'll just mention in passing. In my estimation, the next event on the prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. That is spoken of in 1 Thessalonians 4 when it says that the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remaining shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We're told that it's going to be in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Jesus described it this way. Two will be working in a field. One will be taken and the other left. Two will be in a bed. One will be taken and the other left. This is where we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. This is where Jesus says He will come like a thief in the night. This is not the same as the second coming. That happens later. 
where every eye will see Him. The rapture. Either right before this or right after, it seems to me that a large force to, a force to the north of Israel identified in the Bible as Magog will attack her. Then sometime around this, after the rapture, the Antichrist emerges on the scene. In fact, I don't think he can reveal himself until the church is removed from the earth. And I'll tell you why I believe that in a later message. Antichrist comes. Now, when he first appears, he's not going to be revealed as the wicked man he really is. If Satan ever had a son, it would be the Antichrist. In fact, by many, he will be welcomed and heralded as the Messiah himself. You need to know that the prefix anti can not only be translated against, it can also be translated instead of. And because he'll be a man of peace, because he'll come with global and economic solutions doing away with the currency that we have today, and no one can buy or sell without his mark, because he will get the Jews and the Arab nation to sign a peace treaty, and because he will build the Jewish temple for the Jewish people, he will be welcomed as Messiah. Many religious Jews today believe that when their Messiah comes, he will rebuild their temple. They don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. They believe their Messiah will bring peace and rebuild the temple. Two specific things the Bible says Antichrist himself will do. But then midway in the tribulation period, the beast or the Antichrist uh, commits what Jesus describes as the abomination of desolation. This is where he erects an image of himself in the temple and commands people to worship it. Then we read of a tribulation period where there is plague, where there is war, where there is famine, disease, pestilence, etc., culminating in the battle of Armageddon, fought in the valley of Megiddo. Then Christ himself comes out of the heavens and returns to the earth. This is an open visible global event that everyone will see. Now where are you and I in all of this? We're in heaven with the Lord during the tribulation period and we're with the Lord when He comes back again to this earth. Then the millennial reign of Christ begins, also called the millennium. Millennium means 1,000. The 1,000 year reign of Christ where Satan is chained. Then Satan is released from his pit for a short time he engages in a final rebellion. He's cast into the lake of fire and the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven to the earth and effectively heaven and earth become one. Sometimes we say, well, I'm just gonna live in heaven forever with the Lord. That's not technically true because actually you're gonna come back to planet earth which will be in a glorified state and this will be the fulfillment of the prayer that Jesus offered when he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's a quick overview of things to come. These are things that are yet in our future. Now let's look a little bit at the past because as we look at this prophecy of Jesus and see how accurately it was fulfilled, we will see how trustworthy the prophecies are when they speak yet of our future. Let's go to Mark chapter 13 now. We're gonna start with verse um, one. And we're going to read down to verse 8. And by the way, this, these are the teachings of the Lord that parallel what he said also in Matthew 24, also known as the Olivet Discourse. Then as he went out of the temple, verse 1, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said to him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another that will not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Jesus answered them saying, take heed that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he and will deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Don't be troubled. For such things must happen, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. Drop now down to verse 19. For in those days there will be tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. 
And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom He chose, He shortened the days. If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, He is there, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed and see, for I have told you these things beforehand. Now, the key statement is in verse 8 of Mark 13. These are the beginning of sorrows. Sorrows means birth pangs. You ladies know who have had children that those labor pains get closer together. And the closer together they are, that means that the birth is imminent. And that's how the Bible is describing these things. So we see an earthquake here. We see a war over there. We see another incident over here. These are like the birth pains. But notice that they get closer together, closer together, closer together. What we just read here in Mark 13, paralleled in Matthew 24, paralleled in Revelation chapter 6, is the description of the tribulation period beginning with the emergence of Antichrist and ending with the return of Jesus Christ. That is still in the future. It has not yet happened. But I want you now to focus in here on what it is saying in particular about the temple. Because here they are referring to the magnificent second temple that loomed over Jerusalem, the sun reflecting from its gold. Today when you look at the profile of Jerusalem, you see a large building with a golden dome on it. That is not the temple, of course. That is the Dome of the Rock. But uh, the scene that these disciples were looking at was the second temple that was being rebuilt by Herod. In fact, that particular temple was in construction for 46 years. So you thought your building project took long? And tragically, it was only seven years after it was completed that it was destroyed. I'll talk about that in a moment. But here's this temple. Magnificent. They're saying, look at this temple, Lord. And indeed, it was one of the wonders of the ancient world. But then I want you to notice what Jesus says in verse 2. Do you see these buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. That is a very specific prediction. This is one that will either happen or it will not happen. And in the moment, imagine how implausible that seems. First of all, why would anyone dismantle this magnificent temple? And secondly, how would they do such a thing? But Jesus was going on record as He is telling us about the other events of the end times. This temple will be dismantled. So now we look back historically with 2020 hindsight. And we ask ourselves the question, did this happen as Jesus predicted? Answer, yes, to a T. Because we know that on A.D. 70, Titus, the Roman general, built large wooden scaffolds around the walls of the temple buildings, piled them high with wood and other flammable items, and set them ablaze. And the heat from the fires was so intense that stones crumbled because the reason he did this was he wanted the melted gold. And so they dismantled the temple stone by stone to retrieve the gold and the prophecy was fulfilled exactly as Jesus said. So why is this important? Because God made a prediction and it came true. And this is only one of many, many prophecies that have already been fulfilled. Therefore, if what He said in the past has happened, then we can sure what He says in the future will happen. The Bible is the one book that dares to predict the future time and time again with 100% accuracy. Now let's come to a huge sign of the last days that we'll sort of focus on for a few moments. The nation Israel. In verses 28 to 30 she's compared to a fig tree. Learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches already become tender and it put forth, puts forth leaves, you know summer is near. So likewise when you see these things happen, what things? The budding of the fig tree. Know that it's near even at the doors. Assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. On more than one occasion, the nation Israel is compared to a fig tree. In Hosea 9.10 we read, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. In Judges 9, in Joel 1, 
we see Israel referred to as a fig tree again. So here's what Jesus is saying. Now pay attention. He is saying the rebirth of Israel is not just a sign of the last days. It's what we might describe as a super sign. It's a big one. God says the Jewish people will be regathered. Now here is why this is significant. We need to have a little history lesson and think about a brief history of the Jewish people. It goes back to Abraham. When God established a covenant with him in Genesis 17, the Lord said to Abraham, I am the Lord God Almighty. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants. That would be the Jewish people after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, which was yet to be possessed at this point, will be yours. I'll give it as a possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. So God was promising a piece of real estate to Abraham. That real estate, the land of Canaan, is what we know as Israel today. Now, Israel does not possess all the land that God promised them, but they have some of it. They're in their promised land. Now, prior to this statement to Abraham, God made this very important promise in Genesis 12, 3. He said, I will bless you, or excuse me, I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Look, I am not a Jew. I am a Gentile. But I have been grafted into the promises of Israel through faith in Christ. The world is a different place because of the Jewish people. Without the Jews, we would not have our Bible that we so treasure today. Without the Jews, we would not have our Messiah, the Lord Jesus. They played such a significant role in human history and the past and will still play a significant role in the future. And God has made a promise. He says, I will bless the people that bless the Jews and bless Israel and I will curse the people that curse the Jews and curse Israel. Anti-Semitism is from the pit of hell. If you're a true believer in God and in the Bible, you should love God's people and should want to bless them. If you don't believe this promise, open up your history book and look at every nation that has raised their hand against Israel and the Jews. On the other hand, look at how God has blessed the United States of America. And one of the reasons He has blessed us is because we have supported the nation Israel. And as we withdraw our support from them, this is a very dangerous thing because God has promised He'll bless us if we bless them and curse those that curse them. So coming back to our history lesson. So here's the promise given to Abraham. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob has a son named Joseph who sold into slavery by his brothers for 20 pieces of silver. Joseph ends up running the grain supply for Egypt. A famine comes into the land. And so Joseph's family comes to get food. And after he dies and they die, their descendants continue to multiply. Now we fast forward 400 years and we have all these Jewish people living under the bondage of Pharaoh. He's put them to work as his slaves. And uh, in fact, he gets sick and tired of them and decides he wants to start destroying them. And so he gives a decree that all the Jewish baby boys would be put to death. And so Moses' parents take him and put him in this little kind of a baskety boat type device and send it cruising up the Nile River. And he ends up being found by the Pharaoh's household and taken into Pharaoh's home. And, and Josephus, the Jewish historian, believed that Moses was being groomed to become the next Pharaoh of Egypt. But being a Jew, he saw the injustice that his people were experiencing. And then ultimately Moses is raised up by God to lead the great exodus. And so the Jews leave Egypt and they make their way now to the promised land, promised to Abraham. They got on a little bit of a detour. It took them 40 years to get there. That's of course because men were in charge. <laughs> and they wouldn't stop and ask for directions. No, it's not true. The real reason is because of the rebellion against God. So they went around in circles, but they eventually get there. Moses dies. Israel enters the promised land. Now this prophecy has been fulfilled. They're in the land of Canaan that God has promised. And things go reasonably well, but the Israelites begin to turn to false gods. 
We see wicked king after wicked king ruling over them, turning to false idols. God warns them, if you don't stop this, I'll send another nation to conquer you. They don't listen. Ultimately, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon come and take the Jewish people back to Babylon for 70 years. After that time away, the Jews begin to return to their land again. Now we fast forward to the times of Jesus. They're under Roman occupation. And we have uh, the Jewish people crying out for the Messiah. The time is right. And the Messiah arrives. He's largely rejected by his own people. As the Gospel says, he came into his own and his own received him not. Jesus Christ is betrayed. He's crucified on a cross. He rises again three days later. And then he ascends into heaven. Sometime after this, Titus and the Roman legion comes in and they destroy the second temple and effectively the Jews are driven to the four corners of the earth. This was all prophesied in scripture. Okay, but God said the Jews will be given this land, they'll be in the land, they'll leave the land, and then they'll come back to the land. But here's the big thing. God says when they come back to the land again, that's when the prophetic clock starts ticking. Look at the fig tree. When it begins to bloom, this means the last day's events are now unfolding. Psalm 102 verse 16, when the Lord will build up Zion, He'll appear in His glory. So when we talk about the regathering of the Jews into their homeland to become a nation again, it's not just a sign, it's a super sign. Never has a nation been able to maintain its national identity even 300 to 500 years after being removed from its homeland except for the nation of Israel. Ezekiel in chapter 37 said the Jews would return to their land. He said in chapter 37, 21 to 22, he'll take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they've gone. He'll gather them from every side and bring them to their land. He'll make them one nation in the land. Now, the question arises, has this happened? Yes. God promised in the last days he'd gather the Jewish people from all over the world from where they had been scattered. Has it happened? Yes. God promised that the Jewish people would be gathered to a specific place, the land of Israel. Has that happened? Yes. God promised the Jewish people they would arrive and gather in Israel and He'd make them into a nation once they arrived in the land. Has that happened? Yes. God promised the Jewish people He would bring them back and give them the city of Jerusalem. Has that happened? Yes. When? May 14th, 1948. Against all odds, Having lost six million Jewish people in the horrors of the Holocaust, the Jews began to return to their land and the modern state of Israel was born. And the prophetic clock started ticking. That's why it's a super sign. Israel's first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, said, and I quote, If you know the story of Israel and what happened here, and you don't believe in miracles, you're not realistic. Something is wrong with you. End quote. How true. It's a miracle. And interestingly, when they were formed as a nation in 1948, they did not have possession of Jerusalem. That happened later in the 67 war when Jerusalem came once again under Jewish control. Now, hard times are coming because as we will discover in our next message, a large force to the north of Israel will attack her along with its allies. That force is identified as Magog. More on that next time. But now let's just sort of shift gears for a moment. We've just sort of laid a foundation here to simply say the Bible made predictions about end times that are unfolding before our eyes. I've only touched on just a few of them. So how are we to react to all this? What are we to do? Three things we need to do, as we'll find in the text in a moment. We need to wake up, sober up, and suit up. Let's find where that is over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Turn over there with me if you would. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. These are really words to believers living in expectation of the Lord's return. What we are to do. 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul writes and says in verse 6, Therefore, 
in light of the fact that the Lord is coming. Let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those that sleep, sleep at night. Those who are drunk are drunk at night. Let those who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Listen. The teaching of the imminent return of Jesus is a good litmus test of where you are spiritually. Some of these things that I've shared, if you're walking with God, they bring joy and excitement. And you would say along with the Apostle John, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But for others, well, it kind of freaks them out a little bit. Really? He could come back at any moment? See, it shows where you really are at with God. How are we to react to the fact that Christ could come back at any moment? Number one, we're to wake up. Verse six, let us not sleep as others do. You know, there are people today in the church who are asleep. They're not watching the signs of the times. They're not observing the times and seasons. They're lethargic, passive, even lazy. God says, wake up. I'm coming back again. Sometimes people fall asleep in church, literally. And by the way, I can see you when you sleep. <laughs> it sometimes comes as a revelation to people that just as you can see me here, I can see you there. You know, I have pretty good eyesight. I can even see you up there in the balcony. And I know when you're nodding out, and I, I don't go for the little tricks, because I've tried them all myself. You know where you're wanting to sleep, but you don't want to just lay down on the pew. So, so you just sort of do kind of the prayer, kind of the. <laughs> but the giveaway is when you do this, you know, periodically and <laughs> look disoriented and go back into prayer again, you know. It, um... And the other giveaway is when you're still in prayer after everyone has left, you know. You're <laughs> sitting there, <clears throat> you know. There's a story in the book of Acts. It's really kind of funny and also a little tragic but has a good ending where the Apostle Paul is preaching. And the Bible says he was preaching for hours. So be glad when I end on time, okay? I do keep my eye on the clock, believe it or not. And uh, Paul was preaching on and there's this one fellow named Eutychus that's listening. He's sitting up really high over by a window ledge and he falls out because he fell asleep. And he falls to his death. And so they stop Paul. Paul. Eutychus fell out of the window and died while you were preaching. Paul stops preaching, goes over to Eutychus, prays for him to be raised from the dead. And then what does Paul do? He does what any good preacher would do. He finishes his sermon. <laughs> I bet Eutychus stayed awake after that. Aren't? <laughs> Not sitting there anymore. But you know, people in a spiritual state are asleep as well, as I said. They're not paying attention. We should be alert and awake. Now when you were a little kid, maybe you believed in Santa Claus. You know, they, they say there's four phases to life. I've told them to you before. Phase number one, you believe in Santa Claus. Number two, you don't believe in Santa Claus. Number three, you become Santa Claus. <laughs> and lastly, you look like Santa Claus. And uh, <laughs> that's where I am at right now. Um, but, you know, maybe when you were a little kid and you thought Santa was coming, it was hard to sleep on Christmas Eve, wasn't it? Oh, what's Santa going to bring me? And you could hardly wait to see in the morning if Santa remembered, if Santa ate your cookies. And uh, there was a joyful anticipation. That's how we are to be waiting for the Lord. It's not something that's miserable and repressive and confining. It's something that's liberating and happy and joyful. A Spurgeon put it this way, it's a very blessed thing to be on the watch for Christ. It's a blessing to us now. It detaches us from the world. You can be poor without murmuring. You can be rich without worldliness. You can be sick without sorrowing. And you can be healthy without presumption. He concludes, if you are always watching for Christ's coming, untold blessings are wrapped up in that glorious hope, end quote. Well said. We are to wake up. Number two, we are to sober up. We're told over in verse eight, let those who are of the day be sober. Having spent the first 17 years of my life around drunk people, I know how this works. Being raised in an alcoholic home, I, I, I watched drunk people all day long and all night long. And uh, you know, it's funny how drunk people never remember what they said the, day, the night before. 
and you tell them what they do. I didn't do that. Oh no, actually you did. It's kind of funny to watch how inebriated people try to act as though they're not inebriated and it only makes them look worse. No? One of the ways that cops are able to pick off people who are driving under the influence is not because they drive fast but because they drive too slow. They'll be in the fast lane at 20 miles per hour, you know. There's another DUI. Light them up. Woo, woo, woo. Pull them over. But you see, the problem is, is you can be under the influence of a lot of things. You can be under the influence of alcohol. That certainly could be implied here. But you can be under the influence of something else that intoxicates you, if you will. In Luke 21, Jesus says, Take heed to yourselves and be on your guard, lest your hearts be overburdened, depressed, and weighed down with the giddiness and headache and nausea of self-indulgence, the drunkenness of worldly worries, and that day, the day of the Lord, come upon you suddenly like a trap or a noose. See, to be sober means that you are clear-headed, alert. You have your eyes open. You're sane. You're steady. Don't be drunken. Don't be asleep. Wake up. Sober up. And finally, you are to suit up. Verse 3, put on the breastplate of faith and love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Listen, we're in a spiritual battle. And if we don't get that, we're going to be a casualty. The devil is going to try to distract us. And he's going to try to destroy us. Especially in these days in which we are living. The Bible also tells us one of the signs of the end times is people will fall away from the faith giving heed to the doctrines that demons teach. So we have to be oh so careful to know our Bibles and to be walking closely with the Lord. Are you doing that right now? Are you ready for the Lord's return? Here's a parallel verse from Romans 13. It goes right along the lines of what we have just read. And this is from the Phillips translation. Why all the stress on behavior? Because I think you've already realized that the present time is of the highest importance. It's time to wake up to reality. Every day brings God's salvation nearer. The night is nearly over. The day is almost on. Let us therefore fling away the things that men do in the dark. And let us arm ourselves for the fight of the day. Let us live clearly and cleanly as in the daylight. Not in getting drunk or playing with sex or in quarreling, or jealousies. Let us be Christ's men from head to foot and give no chances to the flesh to have its fling. That's it. Wake up. Don't be playing with sexual immorality. Don't be doing things that you know would displease God. Be ready. Be alert. Be watching. And let me ask you in closing today, if Christ were to come back today, would you be ready? The Bible says He is coming for those that are watching and waiting. We already sang that a few moments ago. Are you doing that? Or are you filled with a little bit of dread? A little bit of fear right now? As you think about the fact that Jesus could come. See when Jesus comes for His church, some will be taken, but others will be left. How do you know you'll be ready to be taken? You'll know if you have a relationship with God. But Jesus warns about the wicked servant that's compromising and living an ungodly life. So we want to all be right with the Lord. So when that moment comes and He calls us to heaven to be reunited with loved ones that have died in the Lord before us, we don't have to have any fear of it. We can say, if it's today, good. Tonight, fine. Tomorrow morning, even better. Don't have to go to work. <laughs> I have to show up for jury duty first thing tomorrow morning. Looking forward to that, you know. The rapture came. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But whatever. I'm good with it all. Whenever He comes, that's the way to live. Are you ready to meet the Lord? If not, do you want to be? We're going to close in prayer. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to get right with God because some of you are not ready for the Lord's return. Some of you have not been paying attention to the signs of the times. But this has been a little bit of a wake-up call for you. And I'm going to give you a, a chance to make a commitment to Christ. And some of you may be living compromised lives. Or maybe you're living in a backslidden state. You are doing things you know you should not be doing. And you need to get right with God today so you can be ready for His return. If you need to respond 
Do so now as we close in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we believe your word is true. We see the signs of the times. We see the reminders. And you've told us when these things begin to happen, look up, for our redemption is drawing near. I pray now for any person listening that does not yet know you. Help them to see, Lord, their need for you and help them to believe in Jesus Christ so they can be ready for his return. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying, how many of you would say today, I want Jesus Christ to come into my life. I want to be forgiven of my sin. I want to be certain that when Christ comes again, I'll be ready to meet Him. Pray for me. If that's your desire, if you want Jesus to come into your life and forgive you of your sin, if you want to be ready for His return that could happen at any moment, would you just lift your hand up wherever you're sitting and I'm going to pray for you. If you want Christ to come into your life and you want Him to forgive you, God bless you, God bless you. You want to be ready for His return. Just lift your hand up. I'll pray for you today. God bless you here in the middle, up there in the balcony. God bless you as well. Maybe you're out in the uh, amphitheater. You can raise your hand as well. I can't see you, of course, but the Lord does. Lift your hand up. If you're up in the court building, you can raise your hand there too. I can't see it there, of course, but it's a commitment you're making to Christ. Again, while our heads are bowed, you want to be ready for the Lord's return. Just lift your hand up wherever you're sitting. I'm going to pray for you. God bless you up there in the balcony. God bless you. God bless you over here on this side. Maybe there's some of you that have been living a compromised life. You've been trying to live in two worlds. Immorality, drunkenness, something else. And you're ready to turn from that. You want to be right with God today and recommit yourself to Him. Lift up your hand. Let me pray for you. God's been speaking to you. This is your wake-up call you don't have to pick it up, but I think you should. Anybody else? Lift your hand up. God bless you. God bless all of you. God bless you and you. Lord, I thank you now for each one of these, and I pray you'll give them the strength to stand up and follow you and walk with you from this day forward. Help them to see their need for you and help them to respond, we pray now, in Jesus' name. Amen.